Islands of the Andes Mountains lie 12,000 feet and more above sea level. Their lofty peaks rise to 22,000 feet, the highest in the Western Hemisphere. Here is a world of active and extinct volcanoes, of everlasting snows on majestic peaks. Mountain lakes fed by melting glaciers dot the highland landscape. From the towering heights, mountain streams plunge down and form rivers that flow through fertile plains. Peru is the third largest republic of South America, as large as Texas, California, and Michigan combined. The Andes are the backbone of Peru. They form a wall separating the rainy tropical plains from the barren desert coast. Where rivers flow down from the high mountains to the coast, they often support a rich green oasis in the midst of the desert. But east of the mountain wall, the rainforest extends to the Amazon lowlands. Here, vegetation is lush and dense, a jungle world of tropical flowers, of colorful parrots, macaws, and cockatoos. Wild tribes inhabit this region, which is almost untouched by civilization. These aborigines live in small family groups in the rainforests of the Amazon and have little or no connection with the people of the highlands. Before the coming of the Spaniards in 1532, the vast empire of the Incas existed in these highlands. It extended over the Andean ranges including the greater part of the present-day republics of Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. The Inca warriors conquered much older civilizations that had already existed for centuries in the coastal oases. Only traces remain of their great cities built of adobe. The work of their potters, sculptors, and goldsmiths shows that they had a highly developed culture. High in the mountains, the Inca emperors developed their own civilization. The builders of their fortresses showed a skill that still puzzles us today. No mortar holds these stones together. Only a tight and clever fitting enables them to withstand time and the weather. How did the laborers cut the stones from the quarry without metal tools, without explosives? How did they carry those gigantic boulders, many of them 50 tons or more, up the steep mountains? The Inca civilization died under the sword of the conquerors from Spain. And with it, died the secret of its masons. But the memory of the Incas is not dead. The people of the mountains still remember the mighty emperors. In the Inca capital of Cusco on festive occasions, the highland Indians dress in imperial robes to commemorate the glory of a great civilization. For almost three centuries after 1532, the king of Spain ruled over Cusco. The Spaniards built their churches here and brought their religion to the Indians. Yet today, many of the customs of the Incas still survive, interwoven with Christianity in the lives of these mountain people. Today, nine-tenths of the population in the mountain country is pure Indian, or people of mixed blood called mestizos. Most great Inca cities lie in ruins, but Cusco has survived. Outside its walls, people live today much like their ancestors did under the rule of the Inca emperors. 
in the colorful Chincheros Valley near Cusco. Antonio Chambi works the land which is the source and meaning of life for his people. Antonio is harvesting potatoes, the staple food of the Indians. It was from Peru that the conquistadores carried potatoes to other parts of the Western world. Antonio's eldest daughter, Pilar, helps harvest potatoes. Each member of the family shares in the planting and harvesting. The community as a whole, as is customary among the South American Indians, has common ownership and use of the land. Antonio's wife and his sister are sorting potatoes. Some will be sold. Some will be preserved by an old Inca method, left to freeze during the night and thaw during the day until all juices are evaporated. Such dried potatoes keep indefinitely. The Spaniards introduced cattle to the highlands. In time, milk became an important part of the Indian diet. The animals graze on common pasture land. Here, the soil is so poor that no crops will grow. Many of the animals living in these high altitudes have thick protective coats of hair or fur. Llamas belong to the camel family. They provide hair that can be woven into warm cloth. They also serve the Indians as beasts of burden. Alpaca sheep and wild vicuñas are prized for their fine wool. Every day, the village sheep are herded to the pasture by the lake. At sunset, they are driven back to the village. Sheep are the greatest source of wealth for the village. Their wool is the most important export of the Indians in southern Peru. In spite of bright sunshine, the mountain people dress in heavy woolen clothing because the mountain air at this height is always cool. Weaving is truly an Indian craft. Indians invented methods of weaving before the arrival of the Spaniard. Their looms are still crude, but their hands are quick and skillful from long practice. Each village takes pride in its original designs and patterns. These change little through the years. The Chambi house is large enough for both the younger and the older members of the family. Ordinarily, the grandparents eat with their children. On sunny days, meals are eaten out of doors. Food consists mainly of boiled potatoes and some cheese. Like most people of these highlands, both the older and younger chumbies chew the flavorful coca leaves. Coca leaves are a mild narcotic which reduces the sensation of hunger or fatigue. They also drink a native beer made from corn. In this secluded world of the mountains, changes come slowly. But changes are beginning to take place. Two of the Chambi children go to school in Chincheros. The law states that children must attend school. But many parents need the labor of their children at home and do not permit them to attend. It is a long walk along the wall which Inca soldiers built long ago. It's easy to see some North American influences in the games played during the recreation period. Wheat was first introduced to the highlands by the Spaniards. They developed a hardy kind of wheat that grows on the sunny slopes. This special strain will ripen in altitudes up to 12,000 feet above sea level. The wheat is dried in the sun. Then it is threshed in this time-honored fashion. Wherever wheat is grown, 
primitive people used this method, except where machines have been introduced. The oxen shake the grain loose. The heavier grains sift through the chaff to the ground. Antonio's village is fortunate. The land is fertile enough to provide food for all the villagers. But many of the farm people in the Andes live in villages that do not have enough land to support them. They work on large estates called haciendas, where they either labor for a share in the harvest or for the privilege of planting and pasturing some land for themselves. They work for a landlord whom they rarely see. The Indians toil long hours at whatever tasks the overseer may assign to them, whether it is work in the fields, driving the master's burros from the field to the remote hacienda, or even carrying loads on their own backs. The village people of this region take their products to sell in the town of Chincheros. The marketplace is the center of life of the entire countryside. Most trading is done by barter. There often is as much satisfaction in comparing each other's goods as in the trading. But market day is not for trading alone. The hour for pleasure, for the fiesta has come. The decorated oxen reveal that this is the day of the feast of harvest time. This ancient pagan feast of fertility is now celebrated as a Christian ceremony. The image of the Virgin is carried in procession. Fiestas give the mountain people much needed relief from daily drudgery. Traditional dances are part of every fiesta. Often these celebrations make sly mockery of historical events. In dances and with masks, they commemorate the Inca Empire of centuries ago. They recall the coming of the Spanish conquerors. They recall, too, the winning of independence from the Spaniards more than a hundred years ago. And they express their hope that the glory of olden times may again return to the highlands. Whenever mothers meet, there is talk about the young men who have left the village to work in the mines. The mines are the new hope of the people of the Andes. The Indians of Peru are learning new skills. They are drilling into the mountain instead of scratching on its surface. They are extracting the mineral wealth of the Andes. Zinc, copper, lead, silver, vanadium and bismuth. As a result of their developing economic strength, the Indians are gaining a voice in running their country. Labor unions have come into being along with political movements. The landless Indian has new hope. For although 62% of all employed people are still engaged in agriculture, more and more of the nation's revenue is coming from the mines. Some of the mining camps are located over 15,000 feet above sea level. From these heights, minerals are transported to the coast over the highest standard gauge railroad in the world. The train climbs three miles above sea level and then down to the capital city of Lima and on to the port of Callao for export. Lima, the city of kings, is the heart of Peru. During Spanish colonial times, Lima was foremost among South American cities. Its magnificent mansions, carved wooden balconies, and grilled windows rivaled its Baroque churches in beauty. Today, the past and the present are meeting in this city of kings. The hands of the tenant farmers and of the mine workers create the wealth of the country. This wealth is reflected in Lima, which is politically, culturally, and commercially the most important city in Peru. From here, the nation of 10 million is governed. From its banks and office buildings, 
Peru's financial and commercial life is controlled. It is through Lima that Peru looks to the outside world. And it is from here that the will and effort to create a better tomorrow is spreading across the ancient region that once was the empire of the Incas. <laughs>